Hi guys, thank you very much for joining the NetHeat Swam Labs today for our featured webinar on bringing the lab experience online in an emerging global education environment. My name is Amanda and I'll be your dedicated host throughout the presentation. Before I hand the mic over to our uh, other host, let me take a moment to review the webinar logistics and give a brief introduction to today's events. We encourage you guys to participate in the conversation by asking questions and sharing resources. Please use the chat function to join in the conversation. If you have any questions, please add those to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We have two distance learning specialists on the call today in addition to our hosts, Taylor and Vanessa, who will be answering your questions in real time. Otherwise, Dr. Ben will address any unanswered topics at the end of the presentation so everyone has clarification on information they're looking for. All attendees will be entered into a raffle to win a $100 Amazon gift card. We'll share the lucky winner in our follow-up email tomorrow, along with a recording of this webinar for you to reference moving forward. So what can you expect to see today? Our chemistry subject matter expert, uh, Dr. Ben Shoup, will show how HOL is solving distance learning gaps for online, ed uh, online science labs while retaining course rigor. Throughout this webinar, you'll learn about the history of online science education and the technology that has revolutionized the way students learn, a comparison between traditional brick and mortar labs versus online labs through the lens of case studies, and a detailed look into HOL's review process and pedagogy toward content creation. If you don't already know our host today, Dr. Ben Shoup is our chemistry subject matter expert and has been the beating heart behind the HOL chemistry curriculum. Without any further ado, a warm welcome to Taylor, Vanessa, and Dr. Ben Shoup. Thank you, Amanda, uh, and thank you all for attending today's webinar. So again, as we talked about, this is a presentation is gonna be talking basically about how we can compare both brick and mortar, which you're probably used to in traditional labs, to online labs, and how, you know, especially with the situation we're in right now, where everything is kind of moving towards online, how can we show you what those two things are? So, to kind of just give you a quick background, right, we're gonna give you a quick little history uh, of online education uh, in the world and how that's gone from where it started to where it is now. Uh, I'm gonna go over just some, what you traditionally think about when you talk about brick and mortar chemistry labs, and then I'm gonna go over some myths that you may think you, that you've heard about online labs and how we're gonna dispel those. And then finally, how HOL uh, designs our content from start to finish and then how we can look at those and looking at how you look at a traditional brick and mortar lab or on campus lab and how they compare directly to an online lab that we currently have in our library. So to give you a little background, the first ever online uh, class that was ever taught was back in 1994 by Cal Campus. In that same year, HOL was launched, HOL was originally launched as uh, an option for students who were taking classes up in Summit County. And some of the students were getting you know, weather inclements that could not allow them to come to campus. And so because of that, the two founding members of our company started kidding their own stuff so their students could do it outside of their normal three hour window that they had to do every, every week for their lab and this started in chemistry and physics and now we've grown to nine different disciplines from there. Uh, moving along this right we've more and more classes have been moving to online as we can see you know by 2009 five and a half million students have gone there. I mean almost by this point in 2018 as you can see 98 percent of public universities now offer some form of online program and to mirror all of this too as we talk about HOL started in 1994 and we've evolved Tremendously, you know, we used to, you know, send out printed copies of our lab procedures, and then in 2016, we really moved forward to kind of meet the times and the technology. We launched HOL Cloud, and that's what we will talk about today. But that's exactly what we wanted to do. This is a completely cloud-based um, delivery platform for all the content that I'm going to talk to you today about. So from there, when you think about a traditional chemistry lab, right? This is typically for students who are, we're looking at first and second year college kids. Um, typically, they have a three hour block that they're going to come to campus. So say this is a one to four lab. If they come in late, they cannot make up any of that time. And once the class ends, say at four o'clock, they can no longer contribute and finish the lab. 
Uh, so these are typically, you know, every week, once a week, or some, for some classes, this could be multiple times a week, depending on the class. But typically for chemistry, we're thinking about a three-hour lab. So again, to get this to work, typically you have to have a lab instructor. This could be considered a teaching assistant, such as a graduate student or an actual teacher, depending on your university. And the students must come there and then interact with the lab instructor. They will typically you know, lead some kind of discussion at the beginning of the lab, watch over the students as they go through the lab. From the school end too, what they're gonna look at is they're gonna buy chemicals for their entire semester. They'll probably have more than one section of that lab. Uh, depending on the size of the school. You know, some schools that are universities that have 30,000 students may have, you know, 50 or 100 sessions. But the big thing that's limit, a limiting factor for them in terms of their enrollment is that most lab spaces for teaching labs can only adhere to 24 students because of the actual physical limitations. So say you're taking an organic chemistry lab, right? This typically has, say, two to a fume hood. There's only 12 fume hoods. That means that you can only have 24 students. Due to safety reasons, you can't go over that. But this is kind of what you would traditionally think about for uh, a brick and mortar and on-campus um, uh, lab. So we'll, we'll, go, we'll go into what online labs are, obviously, for the rest of the presentation, but just kind of dispelling some of these myths that you may have heard about them. So right, a lot of people will say that you know, taking a lab online is not the same as a campus. It will never accomplish the same goals or anything like that. Students don't actually get hands-on ex experiments where they're not going to do anything. A lot of people think that they're just doing digital exercises. So say for, you know, if we're talking about biology, for example, all the student will ever get is just a picture of a cell. Um, and they'll never actually handle cells or handle a microscope. Or in chemistry, they're not going to actually do, you know, mixing chemicals and isolating some kind of product or monitoring the different chemicals and units and mass and scales and things like that. They also think that these experiments don't mirror what a traditional lab is, right? You have what you, th the different labs that you've taught, especially if you've taught in multiple universities, you understand that labs can be very similar from most schools to schools. So we want to show you that that is the, not the case, that they do actually mirror the similar stuff. Um, they also think that students have no way of interacting with their instructors, right? It's because a lot of these online labs, these are being done at home. They're not coming to campus. They don't have a way to actually talk to either their instructor or what the equivalent of a lab instructor would be. These labs don't engage the students, but they're not, if you think that they're not doing anything by their hands, it's not gonna engage them as much. And then the quality of the actual content that you're talking about of a face-to-face -face lab is less. And you know, I'm here to say and kind of spell all these, and none of these are true, right? From us, what we do is, if we start with just talking about what your syllabus is, right? So we have scientists in every subject matter act group that we, that we teach, right? So we have nine different disciplines. So for me as a chemist, I would take your syllabus and match it to the best um, learning, based on our, our learning objectives, match it to your syllabus. So it's a one-to-one -one comparison. And we'll talk about, show you exactly what that one-to-one -one looks like in a second. And then from there, you know, we, we built these to kind of mirror the same idea as an online uh, lab. So we do have everything they get is, you know, lab grade materials. They'll get beakers and graduated cylinders and pipettes, and they'll get pre measured out um, chem bags, which have the exact quantity of chemical that they need for the lab, as well as the concentration that they'll need. And so they're going to use all that in a procedure that was built and designed by HOL um, subject matter experts that started with the procedure first and made sure that works. And then it's sent out and then we built out the background and then the test your knowledge kind of your testing section at the end of that lab. Um, the big thing too when we talked about interactivity for the students, right, is because these are going to be hands-on experiments. A lot of them are going to be a lot smaller scale. Um, so, you know, maybe you're thinking of a lab, a student may use about a gram material or maybe 500 milliliters of solution. We're just going to scale that down because the students are doing this at home. They don't have, this, they give them, for us for shipping too, we want smaller quantities, but the same type of materials such as they're gonna get hydrochloric acid or they're gonna get some kind of acid base reactions they're gonna talk about. That. Again, for all the questions, we'll get into this more in detail, but all of our questions are completely interactive for the students. So we'll talk about how in the beginning of the lab, they're gonna use these type of questions where they're gonna move answers and get a response and feedback right away. They're gonna get questions that are related to the content that we talked about in a little bit. And so things like that. So these are all you know, we went to like online labs, these are like at home labs, they're just a lot smaller scale, but the rigor is still there that you normally would expect from a lab that a student's going to do on campus. So, talking about the pedagogy of HOL and how we designed all of our content, 
So there are the five E's of scientific learning and they work in a circle and work with each other. So if you're teaching on at campus and you have a lab that's on campus, a, a good teaching method is using all five of these together. So you have, where you want to engage the students, explore with them, you want to explain in detail, elaborate, and then evaluate all that knowledge they've gone, and then you can restart this cycle over and over again. For, for, for online labs, for, for HOL, for laboratories, typically they're covered by those three sections. So this is explore, elaborate, and evaluate, and the other two sections are supposed to be complemented with your um, t uh, classes that you teach you know, like this, your Monday, Monday, Friday, you know, class you talk to your students. So for us, uh, the exploration section covers that explore topic, the elaborate section, so we're gonna apply that knowledge that they learn in the exploration section into the experiment, is in our experimentation section. And at the end, we're gonna evaluate all the knowledge they gain in the explore and elaborate, or the ex exploration and experimentation section, to make sure that they've got a full comprehensive knowledge of all that information. So looking at how our stuff looks like, we have a, a cloud-based platform. Your students will log in. There's a single login that they can be you know, tied to your LMS. But for us, what they're gonna look like is this is gonna be the first landing page they have. And so what you'll see at the top and the exploration section and experimentation and evaluation section is a time component with them. So in this lesson, they're told that the exploration, so which is where they're gonna learn all the background content to prepare them for the next few, the following exercises in this lesson, they're gonna to need to set aside about 30 minutes. Now they can complete, complete this in a shorter amount of time or take longer, they're not gonna be timed out, but this is so that when your students at home and they have to think about what they're gonna do, is they say, okay, I have to set a 30 minute time block aside for me to be able to accomplish from start to finish my exploration section. So then at the beginning, the next thing they're gonna get is they're gonna get learning objectives. So the learning objectives for the exploration section are gonna be different than the experimentation section, which we'll talk about in a second. But in the exploration section, this is where we're gonna talk about topics that are gonna be like define, discuss, describe, and all, as you can see, all these learning objectives start with some kind of action verb. And the reason this is done on purpose, because this is all adhering to our um, Bloom taxonomy, which uses these action verbs to kind of define them for the students. So all of these things, so if you look at the first one, right, we got define, titration, titrant, analyte, equivalence or circumventure point, these definitions are going to be defined in the upcoming sections of our exploration pages. And same thing with anything else that goes along with this stuff. So then the next step we're going to talk about, I'll show you in an interactive video in a second, is we're going to talk about um, where the student is actually, for all of our stuff, is going to get what we call a pretest, which is going to be a test your knowledge. So this is a type of questions that can be made as a kind of say, okay, we want to test your students. These are kind of things that they're going to see in the exploration section. They're all going to be interactive. So they're going to be drag and drop questions to fully engage your students. Um, and then these type of questions, when they get them wrong, they're going to get immediate feedback back saying what they got wrong. And the reason why we want to do that is for metacognitive learning theory. And so this will say, okay, when they see this in the exploration section in the next upcoming pages, their brain will automatically identify those things that they saw that they got wrong in the beginning part, but if they already learned it and got it correctly, they don't need to, you know, learn that as deeply, for example. So for that, what it's going to look like in this short video, as you can see, is their students are going to be able to scroll down and click on this pretest. You're going to see this first one, which is a ranking question, and then we have some kind of matching question. And so for this, what they're going to be able to do is they're going to drag these answers over to the correct answers over here, and they're going to be able to continue to cycle through this next one. So the next one, of this is going to be you know, matching some kind of conversions. So this is a basic lesson talking about the basic techniques. And this is actually gonna be related to one of our case studies in a second. But again, they'll be able to drag and drop these over. And then at the end, once they submit that, either they'll get a red or a green check, a red X or a green check mark, bring back to say, hey, this is what you got wrong. This is what you got right. So that you can see in the next upcoming sections for them. And then they'll be able to scroll down and hit next and that will bring them to the first exploration page. And so, so on that exploration page, what you'll see for them is that, and this one is a longer experiment, but it has you know, 10 pages. The first one is gonna talk about SI units. And what you'll see for all of our exploration pages is that it's gonna have some kind of you know, header up here. It's gonna to relate to the exploration and called explore. And then it's gonna have a block of text 
followed by some kind of image to kind of break up that cognitive overload as your students are going to read through this material. And at the end of all of these pages, there's going to be another type of multiple choice question or, or true false question that the student will answer. Um, and it will immediately be the same kind of click and then they'll answer the question and all that information will be held on this page and this page alone. And then they'll get again immediate feedback whether or not they got it correct or incorrect. If they get it incorrect, they'll get immediate feedback telling them what the correct answer is so they can learn that information moving forward. So then we move on to the experimentation section. So the experimentation section is broken up into three parts. Again, we have this kind of learning objectives where we're going to find what the student's goal is. So these are going to change the type of both the learning objectives are going to be different than what we saw in the exploration section, as well as the action verbs. Because in the beginning of the exploration section, we had you know, define as, we, as an action verb. In this case, once they've defined and learned that information, now we want to apply that information. Right? So maybe they learned, they were defined what a titration is, and now we're going to apply that titration experiment. You're also going to get a materials table. And that materials table, as you can see down here, right, the next part will talk, we'll show them all the materials that they need to have to get out of their kit to succeed in this experiment and that they'll need for the next, say, upcoming exercise or two. So what you can see from this video is that this is the actual exercise one. And so it can start out with a, a video, as you can see here, this, this is a technique that the student will use. It'll be a, say, a key technique. It's gonna show them how to use their digital scale. They'll be able to scroll down this thing and it'll have their step-by-step -step instructions as we go through all this information for them. And you'll be able to see different photos. So in this case, you can see a, this is a setup that they would have to do. They got the previous uh, set of instructions were right before that. And then they'll see an image of what that setup will look like. The materials will also reflect this. So they will say, okay, you need these items to be able to assemble this. The nice thing about HOL Cloud as well is that we have data collection features that are built into it. And in that part, what we have is it does not require the student to ever leave the page. And so in this case, it's just a toggle button. This works on any type of device. So if this was, say, a smartphone or a tablet or a desktop or a laptop, it doesn't matter. It all works the same way. So what it allows the students to do is, okay, they can follow their procedure down. They get to a step where they have to record something. So in this case, maybe they have to record length of different items and say centimeters, millimeters, and meters of, say, four different items. So they can get to that page, part of the procedure, hold up, enter in the information. And for the students, the information automatically saves every three seconds. And then once they continue on, what you'll see is they can be able to toggle between the different data tables. So it doesn't matter if on exercise one, two, or three, they'll be able to go back and forth between them. And then once they're done entering the information, they can click the data table and it will shrink down. They continue down the procedure until this, they finish the entire exercise in this case. And so other types of, so this is just showing data tables, but we have other types of data collection. One of the more popular ones that we have in our stuff is having a, uploading a photo. So say we want to have a student make a setup that looks maybe something like this or something similar to that. What the student will then be able to take a photo. So if they're using their smartphone, they can take it directly on their smartphone. They come to the data collection. They can drag and drop it into that image upload. And then they're able to, it will automatically resize it for them and all that thing. And all they have to do is just upload the image. There are other things as well as we could provide them with an image and they have to say, uh, label it. Again, with that image tool too, if they're using say something in biology where they take an image of a cell underneath a microscope or something, they can then upload that image and then label the different parts of the cell if they want to. Or in chemistry, you know, we're using a lot of data tables, um, you know, so they'll be able to collect all their data and maybe there's some equations that they'll have to do and then apply it and further do that information. So the final part of the um, uh, cloud is for the final th three E's of the five E's that we talked about earlier is the evaluation section. So again, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna tell the student, okay, this is everything you should have learned in both the previous two sections, the exploration and the experimentation. We're gonna summarize all the learning objectives for them. Before they proceed, they have to say, okay, yes, I am ready to go on to the next step. Once they do that, it locks them out of the previous two sections so they can't go back and look at their information because what we're gonna do is we're gonna give them an evaluation test at the end, which are gonna be multiple choice questions to start. So again, what you'll see here in this quick video is that someone will go down, they'll click the evaluation, and they'll have different types of multiple choice questions. The student will then have to respond back and answer this question in one of these four answers, for example, and they'll hit next. And once they get to the end, which we'll show you in a second, 
then they'll have they'll get immediate feedback of what they got right and what they got wrong where that information was on the in either in the exploration or the experimentation section and finally if they got it incorrect what the correct answer was it will also tell them what the learning objectives that they were trying to accomplish so they can get full feedback of what they got right and wrong in this part so as we proceed we'll see we would go on to the next questions and as we proceed to the very end of this then they'll have to submit all their answers say okay are you done are you finished because they can go back and tether between these questions so they hit that finish button and then they're going to be done and so now they have all their questions so in this case they left them all blank but we're highlighting all the true answers for them and then they can click on the extension question so an extension question for example is going to be something where okay you learn all this material and the, and the experimentation section and the exploration section can you apply this to something that you haven't seen yet but that is related so in this case we're going to talk about something with density this is referring to something they may be semi-familiar with so Raiders of the Lost Ark you know it's a movie where they have a gold idol and so they have to explain their answers based on these type of questions to kind of apply further knowledge to that. So finally, what we're going to talk about is two kind of general chemistry labs that you're probably familiar with and probably teach at your university. So the first one is, you know, laboratory techniques. So most times when you have a student, when they come to school and take a chemistry class, the first one will be, okay, how do you use the instruments, right? So the first one will be like a scale. So you say, okay, use the scale, measure one gram of material or measure something. And then, you know, they use a graduate cylinder, determine volume of say a solution. And then sometimes they also do, the next thing where they'll combine those two things. So sometimes you give them an unknown metal and you'll say, okay, determine the mass and the volume of that, that metal. And then using that information, calculate a density of that unknown and then figure out from that density, can you identify the unknown correctly? Again, to another common technique that you'll teach them in this kind of lab is taking temperature. So you look at something like heat up a solution to boiling, take temperature of water, put it in an ice bath, take temperature of that ice bath, things like that and record that. So HOL does this exact same, same experiment. We call this laboratory techniques and measurements. So again, what you'll, your students will have and will be, they'll get a ruler in their kit. It goes in centimeters and they'll be able to take, as we saw in some previous slides, they'll be able to take a measurement of some four defined items and then record that in a data table and they'll take a temperature of water uh, and then they'll use a digital pocket scale that I'll show you in a second uh, to take the mass of various items and then from there they'll they'll use their graduate cylinder and calculate the density of two different liquids so in this case we're going to talk about water and isopropanol and then they'll determine the density of, of various solids as well and then at the very end they're going to do learn how to do solutions uh, making from a stock solution and then forming dilutions on those solutions and calculating out the change in concentration and then graph all the information. So in that case, they'll graph it, take a photo of it and upload it to the cloud. And so as you might want to know is like, what does this type of stuff look like, right? So a student will get a scale and they'll have to you know, measure it. And so in this case, we have a digital scale that comes in almost every single kit that's especially to do with chemistry, it has two decimal points with it, it comes with the, you know, they'll have to weigh out some material on it. And then also on the, on the right-hand side, as you can see over here, we're using a volumetric flask. It's a 25 milliliter volumetric flask. The student just gets that. They're gonna, you know, for the sugar solution they're gonna have to make, then they're gonna have to fill it up and make a stock solution based on the, the calculations and concentration we tell them in the procedures. So another common lab we'll talk about for the second lab that you may be probably teaching or from, at least familiar with is titrations, right? I mean, when I was a, under, a graduate student at uh, UC Davis, you know, chem to be almost the entire part of that lab, those labs were all titrations. So this was looking at um, some kind of unknown solution, either an acid or a base. We're going to use a specific indicator that's going to hit an endpoint that we're looking for. We're going to do a titration three times to determine the concentration of an unknown, and then figure that out to figure out the exact concentration of an unknown. Sometimes you could do this, say, you're, and in this case, over here, what you can see is you got your, your what you can think of as your titration um, setup where you have a burette and you're titrating into an own wire flask and you're hitting some endpoint where it's turning that pinkish clear. So in this case, this is probably phenol failing. So for HOL, we can do titrations as well. So for us, one of our, our most popular experiments is the titration of acetic acid and vinegar. And so what this the student is going to do is they're going to get a known concentration of sodium hydroxide. We're going to give it to them in a dropper bottle. And then they're going to use phenolphthalein as an indicator because it only takes one or two drops to hit that endpoint. And they're going to perform three titrations against an unknown concentration of vinegar. 
And at the end, they're gonna determine the percentage of vinegar inside, or percentage of acetic acid inside that vinegar solution and determine that. And then determine percent error and things like that. So for us, this is what our setup would look like, right? So what you have here is, instead of using a burette, uh, we're gonna use a 10 milliliter um, syringe. And then we have a stopcock that screws into the bottom of it. We can fill this up with say water so they can rinse out the thing first and drain it into there. And when they're ready, we can fill this up with their solution. In this case, we're gonna talk about saying hydroxide. And in the beaker will be the um, uh, vinegar solution. And then as they titrate, they're gonna hit some endpoint and they're gonna get a pink color again to indicate that that's it. They're gonna calculate the difference in volume to determine from the, the moles of sodium hydroxide, titrating against it to figure out the moles and then continue down to figure out the actual concentration of vinegar, of the acetic acid in vinegar. So what you can kind of see, right, is we have here where they're using kind of more smaller common things. So we have here for the actual holder is we're using a test tube clamp and they can use books to determine the height of it. So they can sit over that beaker. And again, as we talked about, you're probably more familiar with a burette, but that's not to say, so burette, maybe that's a 50 milliliter burette, we're just using a 10 milliliter um, syringe. And again, we have a stopcock so we can control the, the flow rate, adding one drop at a time. And again, this is probably all the materials your student would need for this. They're gonna need some distilled water. They're gonna get that syringe. They're gonna get their stopcock. They're gonna get this reusable or, or disposable pipette, depending on what they need it for, so gloves and safety goggles that go along with this. So at this point, we're gonna conclude the presentation. I thank you for your time and I'll answer any questions that we have at the thing. Again, if you want to learn more information about our platform and see it up close and personal, please do not hesitate to contact us and you can contact your sales rep at hlscience.com. And if you give us the promo code from this ACS 2020, because this presentation was gonna be used at the ACS national meeting, we greatly appreciate it. At this point, I'll turn it back over to Amanda and I'll answer any questions that are remaining. Hey, Ben, thank you. So a couple of great questions that we had uh, from some of the instructors like Brenda Rushing and uh, Jennifer Van Wick was, uh, how would instructors ensure that students are actually doing the labs and answering the questions? And are the questions randomized um, or algorithmic? Uh, yeah, so I'll start with the end with the, the questions. So all of our questions are, are not randomized. They're all the same in every lesson because we write the questions to adhere to that you know, learning theory that we've, we were discussing earlier, right? So all the questions, it's really hard for us to create a random question bank of things. We want the answers and the questions reflect all the material that they covered in those previous sections. Um, as for how can you ensure that your students are answering the questions and stuff like that, I mean, if they leave it blank, they're gonna get zero points. I mean, that's the short answer of it, but you can add in different ways to ensure that your students are doing it. So we've had instructors in the past who said, they set up, okay, when the student starts the experiment and they make up their setup, they have to take, say, a selfie with all of their setup to prove, and it timestamps everything for them, right? So that's one way that you could kind of improve it. I mean, a lot of stuff, too, when they do have to take a photo of something, for example, if they're taking a photo of their results, they're required to put their name and their date on that. And so they'd have to, it's how we can kind of handle that. Um, and a follow-up question that she had to that was, um, she's considering having students take pictures to submit them like you suggested. Does the online program have a feature that would allow them to submit a photo? It depends on the lesson, but there are ways that we can discuss on how to do that. Um, one of the ways I guess you could have is your students, if you had an external program, but within the cloud, we can create a uh, you know, a custom lesson where it's just uploading a photo for you and it's just, that's all that's in there. And you just have your students submit a photo for every lab. That'd be one way to do that. Okay, so awesome. The one other question that Brenda had was, um, what if the experiment, what if the students uh, complete the experiment, but they make an error and they, and the instructor allows them to correct this and um, adjust their final report? Yeah, so it has to do with their, their data, for example, if they make a calculation error, um, you can unlock their lesson so they can go back and fix any of that kind of data error. If your student, you know, used up all the material, um, they can always contact your customer service and either purchase additional material for them that they can choose how they want to ship it overnight for them. 
Um, it just depends on the kind of specific issue, but we can, and if they're having any issues as they go through a lesson, they're welcome to reach out to us and we can kind of help them figure out if it's a, you know, something they didn't get in their kit or if it's more likely they just need some more guidance to help. We do have scientists that can answer questions on that. Great. Um, one other question is, uh, do we offer organic chemistry? We, are, we offer some at the moment. We are in the process of developing um, to have available for the fall. We're developing currently 10 ex between seven and 10 experiments to have kind of a single semester. Uh, as you can imagine, organic chemistry is a lot more challenging to do at a distance setting, but we are trying to accomplish that. Um, we have, we're gonna have labs you know, about alcohols and different techniques such as chromatography and things like that. We have a handful of our, that already exist in our library that are on those more um, basic topics, but we are looking to expand our library that way. Okay, great. Um, one question uh, that Stacy Thompson has was uh, concerning safety. What do we do uh, to uh, ensure the students are using their kits safely and, and address that issue with them? Yeah, so when it comes to safety, the great thing about if you use HOL is that we assume 100% liability. As long as your students you know, adhere to the step-by-step -step procedures that are laid out, and as long as none of the, the actual procedures have ever been changed, so if you go in and you know, customize and delete parts of the lesson, which isn't really an option, but if you, that would void that kind of a guarantee. But as long as your students are using our platform and, you know, they're provided both with, you know, goggles and gloves as part of their, every kit that they get and they get enough gloves for every lesson. Also on the scale they're kind of working on is to kind of mitigate some of that. But again, yeah, we'll assume hundred percent liability. It hasn't really ever had been an issue in the past. I would say it can't be, but we are there for you as well. Um, and along those lines, uh, how do we suggest students dispose of chemicals along those safety guidelines? Yeah, it depends on the chemicals itself. I mean, kind of what we say is that for chemical disposal, it's because there are different regulations in every county, it's on the students to look up what their county regulations are and figure out how to properly dispose of them. We do have in each lesson kind of more details specifically how to dispose of them. That's the kind of the best we can do. Um, another question uh, from Barbara Barnhart was, does the HL platform sync with the LMS instantly or is it sort of say midnight every night on Mountain Standard Time or, or like that? Yeah. So all, all it takes for it to be synced to your, your LMS is that we have an LMS um, expert on hand and they'll just set it up when you set up your class for the first time and then it'll automatically sync. So typically you can set it up if you want to as a single you know, point login. So say you're using a platform like Canvas or you know, something like that. As long as your students set it up, they click in through Canvas, it'll automatically launch them to HOL Cloud. They'll be all in the same window. And they, when they exit it out and log out of it, they'll just be back onto their normal browser. Uh, yet we have an expert on hand that can help you set it up, set it up in the beginning. Uh, at the beginning of your semester, the more time you give us, the easier it will be. But yeah, we're there for you. Okay, great. Um, along that lines, um, I'm not sure if you know this answer, um, and I'm gray myself on it, but with the syncing, say an instructor grades in the HOL platform, does it instantly sync to Canvas or Blackboard, or is that one where it would have to wait until, say, 6 a.m. the next morning or something to sync over? Nope, it, it will, it should automatically sync. We, we provide your IT department with course hooks, so they do allow that. You just have to enable it when you first set it up. But yeah, if you grade an HOL, HOL Cloud platform, we do have you know sections in there. So any of those multiple choice questions we talked about uh, or those drag and drop questions, those will automatically grade because they already have the right answer. Things like data tables are when you'll have to go or images uh, those are things that you'll have to go in and grade yourself. You can control, again, the, the scale. So if you want a question to be worth one point or worth zero points or 10 points, you can kind of adjust that. But as soon as you enter in that grade, it'll automatically, as long as you've hooked it up, it will automatically import into your LMS system directly. Wonderful. And then um, I know we have a couple more questions. Um, I'm looking for the one. Uh, a digital scale is in the kit for each different level? No, so we have, uh, depends on, so every lesson that has anything that requires you to measure something with the digital scale, we have two options. Most of the time what a student will get is a precision scale, which is what we saw in some of the photos. 
that goes out to two decimal places. If for whatever reason they need a digital uh, a digital scale uh, that requires a little bit more mass, then we find one that only has one decimal place, but they'll always get it as long as it's a required item for their lesson. Okay. Thank you. And then Teresa Hahn has a wonderful question here. I want to do the experiment with them live from our lab here at the university. Is this strictly asynchronous or can it be set for a specified time? We want to have quote unquote meetings and teams while everyone is doing it at the same time. And yes, uh, Teresa, we do support Moodle as well. Yeah. So for that kind of thing, if you're trying to set it up like what you're talking about, where you want your students to all be observed, you set for that may be something like Teams. But for the other part, what you're asking about is yes, you can determine when your the student is able to look into the lab itself. So you could turn it on and say, okay, my normal lab meeting is say Wednesday from one to four. You can have it so that lesson say unlocks the night before, so the student could do the background section before they come in the lab. You, you can check their timestamps of when they've logged in and stuff like that. And then you say, okay, at that point, it will unlock for them. And then you could say they have a week from that Wednesday to complete it. And at that point, the, uh, you can lock them out of that, la that lab, for example. Or you could start deducting points if they're not submitted all of their work, say in the um, evaluation section at that point. Great, thank you. Um, now, when it comes to supplies and the kits, uh, do students keep the glassware uh, supplies each semester or are certain things returned? It so it depends on how you wanna set up with your sales rep, but what we can do is, say you were teaching a full year course of chemistry and you have semester one where they're gonna use, you know, reusable items such as beakers and volumetric flasks and uh, those kind of durable materials we can set you up with what we call a continuation kit. And so what that means is that the second semester you'll have the student, if they bought a kit for the first semester, they'll just get the um, disposable materials. So like those things like the chem bags or anything like you know, some of the stuff they only have to be able to use once. And then they'll just get that stuff shipped to them instead. And then you can also set it up in that same instance. If a student is say, took it at a different university and now they're in your university for the second semester, They'll get the full kit, meaning all the uh, durable materials they needed from semester one. Great, thank you. All right, I'm just looking to see if there are any other questions. Any last questions from you guys? Oh, one more. Um, Corrine is teaching anatomy and physiology. Is this the same way that, sub um, that subject would be set up? but except for anatomy and physiology. So you showed us chemistry. Would it be the same setup for AMP? Yes, absolutely. We do, AMP is one of our disciplines that we do support. Um, we have a variety of lessons that are a part of that and we can definitely manage that same thing. We can do, again with us, we can give your, your students, they want a, a fetal pig if you want them to do a real dissection. We also have biology, microbiology, geology, and things like that type of material we can talk to you about. We also have GOB chemistry. So if you're looking for that kind of hybrid of general organic and biochemistry, that is another discipline we do have available. Great. Uh, Don Hughes would like to know if we offer any sort of simulations. We do. So in our physics, uh, we do have lessons that incorporate both simulations and um, hands-on labs. So for some of them, as you can imagine, because you do need a high level of precision with some of the physics stuff, so if you think about the classic example, you have weights hanging and you have a thing, you're spinning it above your head. That can be a little bit challenging for your student to accurately count the number of repetitions and the time with it. We have in that lesson is that we have both that and a simulation that your student can do. And so a lot of our physics content has that kind of hybrid where they have both a physical and a, um, simulation that goes along with it. And we do have some lessons that are 100% simulation because we couldn't get that reproducibility, but the content is still good. And they still do you know, calculations. A lot, all of our simulations are were created by FET, which is out of uh, CU Boulder. And the person who designed those labs was a graduate student at CU Boulder who helped design some of the FET less, uh, simulations from scratch. Great. Um, Greg Heroth uh, had a question. Do you have a general supplies list that they would need from home so that students know ahead of time? Yeah. So once your student gets set up and so they purchase 
through our HOL cloud for their kit, they'll gain immediate access. When they get in that access, they'll be able to do two lessons, which is called Getting Started, which teaches them how to go through the platform, and then Lab Safety, which is talking about the different safety techniques they'll need to know, and as well as kind of signing their safety contract. At that same time, they'll be able to see the materials list as one of the pull-down menus. And so they'll be able to see student supplied and HOL supplied items. And so they can go and make a shopping list of things that they need. These are normally pretty common items, you know, such as like, you know, paper towels and distilled water and things like that. We're not asking them to go get crazy random things they don't know. If it's something that is, you know, specific to the lesson that has a specific, you know, specification, we'll provide that and make it for them. Great, thank you. And then uh, Vincent wanted to know, uh, do we have analytical or physical chemistry labs? Um, most of our chemistry labs are kind of targeted at that first semester gen chem with a little bit of the organic part. And then we do again have some GOB lessons. So it's a little challenging for us to do the analytical side, but we could t definitely take a look at what your syllabus look like and give you some suggestions. Great, thank you. So Vincent, please send your syllabus in to us uh, so we can take a look at that for you and get more specific. All right, um, Adrian would like to know if we can share the list of student supplied items. So it will depend on the lessons, right? So every lesson has different types of student supplied items, but you'll get that as soon as you gain access to say a demo site or your like your section that you decide once you kind of adopt a, a lab kit, you'll be able to see all that kind of stuff and you, you can send out to your students immediately or they'll have access as soon as they get onto the cloud. It just depends on which lessons they have and what items they need. And it'll also be broken down by a lesson as well. So each lesson will tell them what they need for the student supply items. Great, thank you. Um, do we offer the labs in any other languages besides English? I know that for ADA compliance, all of our curriculum can be copy pasted into screen readers, um, but do we have any options for other languages like French? At this time, we only have all of our lessons are written in English. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh. And what do we do for extended time for ADA compliance? Can we extend time for just one student? So it depends, right? So there's no time cutoff, right? So you, as you saw those time points, those are just suggested. So if a student says, we're giving them a heads up saying, okay, for you to start to finish this lab, we simply recommend about say two hours or three hours, but at the end of that two hours, your students are not gonna be cut off. And so you can allow to give them, so say they need time and a half or double time, they can continue to work through all of that and they'll just have you know four hours to complete it if there's a two hour time period. Great. Any other questions, folks? All right, I see we've got two more here. Uh, this, oh, Oluder, thank you so much for saying that, you know, it, these times are tough during COVID-19. We want to make sure that as many students as possible are able to continue their education and be successful in that. Um, is there any chance, uh, from, this is from Stacy. is there any chance uh, we can ballpark the student supply estimated cost uh, for your standard kits for intro, Chem 1, and Chem 2? Again, it depends on, these are kind of items that your students should, should already have. Um, and so just, to, I can't give you a ballpark because, you know, I can't even, because every, every kit is different. Um, so, but we're not asking them to spend hundreds of dollars on the student supply items. It should be something between, I don't know, 10 and $30. Um, we've got a question from uh, Dr. Lee at Morgan State. Um, can we set a due date for each lesson? Yeah, absolutely. That's something you can definitely set up. So you can have it where as a due date or a cutoff date so they can't submit their work um, after that point. But yeah, you can set that up so you can, you can order the, lab, the labs however you like and you can have it gated. So it'd say every Tuesday your labs open up and they're good until the following say Tuesday at midnight. And after that point, your students can't submit your work. 
Great, thank you. And then uh, Corrine, uh, yes, you discuss cost with your reps. Yep, and so what we'll do is typically we'll, we'll, when you work with your sales rep to figure out exactly what you want, we'll do a syllabus match with you to say, okay, here's your list of labs that you normally have. This is what HOL has, it's almost identical to what you're looking at. And then from there, we'll generate a quote for you to figure out how much it is. So you can have an idea and we can also work with you. If, okay, you think that's too high, um, we can try to replace some of those labs to get to a price point that you're comfortable with. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm noticing a couple of comments uh, from John and Teresa um, about submitting your labs and trying to get quotes back. I apologize that this is taking um, longer than typical. Uh, we have been inundated with requests. Um, your reps will also be getting um, a copy of this webinar. They'll, they'll get notification. We'll reach out to you as fast as possible. Um, we appreciate your patience in this as we try to help everyone as quickly as possible. Do we have any other questions? I'd love to you know, uh, answer anything else you guys might have. Can the labs easily convert the scores into Canvas? This is a great yeah. one. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you can decide how you want to do your points. You just got to pre-program it. Again, with HOL Cloud, the beauty of it is that once you set it up once, and say you go through, okay, I want to make all my labs worth, say, 50 points. You only have to do that for the first semester, and then it will automatically, every time you do it, you'll clone it over. And again, with those, we'll provide you with the course hooks, and that will be able to sync automatically with your um, different LMSs, and yes, Canvas is one of the LMSs that we do work with. All right. Um, Danny would like to know, um, what I already know is HOL cannot create custom kits at this time because of the high demand. Do you know when this option will become available? Uh, Danny, yes, this will absolutely become available uh, for start dates after June 15th. So definitely get you know your list of labs into your rep uh, if you haven't already spoken with one um, when they do get in contact with you. Um, if you have that list ready as quickly as possible, that the sooner the better. And then, uh, Barbara, what do you mean by just date for fall? Um, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, oh, when does it have to be in by? Um, in order to order for fall? I mean, ideally with any of that kind of stuff, especially now with the more time you can give us, the better, because uh, it allows us to be able to, especially if you want to customize, um, I mean, as soon as possible is, is ideal. But I mean, typically it's about 30 to 45 days lead time would be ideal for you kind of to have an adoption and then we can start building it. And as your students submit and purchase the kits, it's about a you know, seven to 10 day turnaround period. From there, depending on where they live in the country. Great, thank you, Ben. All right. Uh, do we offer a voucher system? Uh, we we can we we can talk to you. You can, you can talk to yourselves about that. But we do offer, say, if you have your bookstore, so you want to say bulk ship them to your bookstore, and they just purchase a voucher ahead of time. You can pick it up from there, or. You deliver it to the bookstore and you ship it out from the bookstore as well. Vouchers are possible, they can be prepaid ahead of time. Okay, great, thank you. So the kits would need to be shipped uh, to their home. So that's something that your sales rep can work out with you uh, between the school, the bookstore, and our warehouse. But that is possible to do that. Yeah, and that's how majority of the students do get their kits. Um, one thing to add to that is we do ship uh, to all residential addresses. We just do not ship to PO boxes. Um, Kate Waters would like to know if students outside of the U.S. can purchase the kits. 
they can. It just is a little more, they just have to make sure that the materials that are going in the kit satisfy the rules of customs. And so it just depends on which country they do live into. Uh, we can't ship it just, it, and if it's going international, it will take a lot longer to get there, but it is a possibility. It is definitely able to go to internationally. Um, you, we do not suggest that if, say, I mean, this may not be in the current situation, but in the future, as travel restriction gets better, we do not suggest that, say, a student took a class in the U.S. and was living in the U.S. and, say, went abroad to another country. We do not suggest them bringing their kit on the plane, whereas instead they ship it to the country directly instead from us. And one suggestion that I can add to that as well personally is um, talk with your sales rep and get a, a content list, a materials list of what's in that kit for the student to take to their customs office uh, to make sure that the kit will get through okay. Um, Perry would like to know what the timeline uh, looks like for organic chemistry labs to be available. Yeah, at this point we're, we're hoping to launch in the fall of 2020. Oh, that's great. But we do, as I said, we do have lessons that already say have covered the topics. So things like molecular modeling, molecular modeling of organic compounds. We have lessons on alcohols. We have lessons on melting point already. We have chromatography of dyes. Um, those are already lessons that are in our library. So there may be some that you, we may be able to already hit and then we're expanding our library to add another seven to 10 experiments to kind of fill out a more robust organic offering. Great, thank you, Ben. All right, guys, just keeping an eye out for any last minute questions before we wrap up in the next few minutes. This is a great time to get them in while we've got one of our scientists on the phone. Um, so Scott White has a great question um, uh, about some feedback that we may have gotten. Uh, what are some mistakes uh, that we've seen from first time user experience? So what are some tips and tricks that we would share that we've seen a lot of first timers live through? Um, it's kind of a hard question to answer, but I mean, a lot of the stuff is just, I mean, navigating the platform can be a big thing if you have questions about how to do that, you know, being prepared ahead of time. I mean, again, anytime you do something for the first time, right, you're it typically takes, a, I'm sure if you've taught semester and after semester, for the first time using, you know, if you teach a brand new lab, knowing where some of those pitfalls may be or where your students have issues, um, those are kind of things that you may foresee. Uh, again, we have people there to help you. So if you do have any questions as you're going through this, it does, you know, kind of the best situation is that once you kind of adopt your kit in your classes, look through it yourself. Um, we have had people in the past, if they say, okay, I've adopted it and say this for the spring of 2021, but I can get a demo kit and say the fall of 2020, that way I could have my students say as a TA or something, run through the labs, look them over, understand where the labs are so that they have an idea of how to go through them for the next falling semester. I'd be kind of some things and just getting it you know, set up uh, so that it is hooked up to your LMS. That's another big one. Great. Um, uh, Oludere uh, Owalabi from Morgan State would like to know if we uh, uh, know all the labs we support and if we're planning on developing in all the STEM or STEAM disciplines, STEM, STEAM. Yeah, I mean, at this point we are looking to expand, but we do cover a majority of, I mean, our target is typically the first year or two of um, class, like science classes. So again, we have chemistry, biology, microbiology, anatomy, physiology, physics, um, GOB chemistry, 
geology. These are all kind of topics we have. So we have nine disciplines and we, we will work to grow again. Organic is going to be the next one we're developing. And as the more feedback we get and from instructors that say we want more of these and the way we can handle them, yeah, we're going to continue to grow our library. Great. Um, how do students report a safety accident? Um, they can call in directly to customer service and or email, you know, customer service and we'll be able to handle that immediately with them. Great. Um, got a lot of really good questions coming in here now. Um, do we have standard pre-built kits for GOB and or general chemistry or is it only custom? Oh, GOB does have a two two pre-built kits for say semester one, which is typically general chemistry. So the kind of topics, I believe it comes with uh, 12 labs as part of it. And then the second semester is the organic and biochemistry side of that. And again, it'll be another 12 labs to kind of mirror a 12 week, um, two semester course. They are pre-built. And again, typically you, in normal times, you can customize it. So if you want to replace it, and with the GOB lessons specifically, the content is written with the students in mind when they were developed with our board of advisors, who was always part of our review process. Those were teachers who were currently teaching GOB chemistry in an online setting and gave us great feedback to make the content as it is right now. Great. Um, and then let's see here. Uh, Teresa Hahn, uh, I have a strong focus on using Beer's Law color metric type analysis. Are there options for that? Yeah, we have a Beer's Law experiment as part of our library, and it is, we do have a uh, custom colorimeter that we've designed. It comes with, it's able to handle two different wavelengths of dyes, and so what the students get in that lesson is they get a red dyed solution, they make a dilution of that, and they get two unknown solutions, and based on graphing that concentration versus the absorbance that they get, which is, you know, they calculate that from the resistance that they monitor, then they're able to figure out, a, you know, create a uh, a graph of that information and figure out the unknown concentrations of the two that are provided in their kit. Um, Stacy would like to know if the physics is algebra based or calc based. Depends on the lesson. Typically it is somewhere in between, but it, it does require some calculus depending on the lesson itself. Okay, great. Um, do you ever customize with an instructor for a more uh, cure-based uh, exper experience. Uh, what is, I'm not exactly sure what cure stands for. Um, C-U-R-E. Yeah, I mean, our content is kind of written as textbook agnostic, right? So the idea is that all the material that's covered in the exploration section is going to be the exact information that they need to get through the experimentation section. And we're not going to add anything extra, but we're not going to leave anything out as well. And so it's supposed to be a standalone. And then as you as the instructor are going to fill in, you know, the, co the color outside that's missing. So that will, you know, go with your lecture material to kind of round that out. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Um, we've got still got a lot of really great questions. Um, Brenda, I would absolutely uh, suggest that you reach out to your rep so we can get you answers um, for a couple of these questions um, regarding data on how well students take um, online lab and then go back to brick and mortar labs. And uh, if we have any plans about micro uh, adding molecular biology or genetics. Um, looks like here, uh, Ben, CURE is course undergraduate research experience. Yeah, so all of our, I mean, with that, all of our uh, labs are written from a standpoint that we guide the student from start to finish because we can't have any, any open inquiry based labs because of our liability. So we can't have to say a student go get a specific material that we're not defining for them that's on their kit. So all of our stuff has to, and that kind of comes back to the question before about safety is that, for us, for our liability, it had, they had to follow our procedures exactly how they're laid out, and it's going to guide them from start to finish. And so, they're, so in terms of research focus, we really don't have that aspect built into our labs. Great. Well, guys, thank you so much for meeting with us today. 
Um, I strongly suggest all of you uh, reaching out, whether it's through our website or the reps that you have uh, already talked with, if you have any further questions. Um, also, if you uh, need to prepare for second summer session or even fall, let's get those uh, handled now so that you know no one's caught uh, off guard should decisions be made to keep things online. I appreciate everyone coming and meeting with us today. Dr. Ben, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a great day, guys.